Bom dia. Vamos dar início à nossa sessão. E essa sessão de agora é, uma, na verdade, uma conferência, uma das conferências a seis que nós uh, programamos para esse encontro. E é uma conferência, uma das conferências de, de análise política. É a conferência do, de um convidado uh, internacional. É com um grande prazer, então, que estamos recebendo Aníbal Pérez Linhã, é professor de Ciência Política e membro do Centro de Estudos Latino-Americanos da Universidade de Pittsburgh, e além de ser editor da Latin American Research Review, um jornal é, da Plaza, um importantíssimo jornal da da nossa área. É, seus estudos né, é, são voltados para questões de democratização, instituições políticas, o governo do Ló, as novas democracias, e é autor de um livro é, de muito impacto e muita importância, influência é, recente, que é o Presidência Impeachment and the New Political Stability in Latin America. É, Maribel tem um, um, um papel de destaque na ciência política contemporânea, é, já vem há muitos anos colaborando em diversas iniciativas com cientistas políticos aqui do Brasil, em, em publicações, em pesquisas, presenças em seminários e congressos. Então, temos acompanhado sua trajetória desde muito tempo. E, portanto, é uma grande satisfação tê-lo aqui. E o seu trabalho, especificamente, sobre a questão das quedas presidenciais e a discussão do problema do impeachment e como enquadrá-lo conceitualmente e como entendê-lo empiricamente é de enorme importância para a discussão atual da análise política, sobretudo para a análise política brasileira. Então, temos uma oportunidade muito boa, nessa manhã, de ouvir uma análise rigorosa sobre o ponto e também encetar um debate com uh, um os principais autores a respeito do tema, que é o Aníbal. Então, sem mais delongas, queria passar a palavra para o Aníbal, Uh, estamos pensando em ter aqui 40, 45 minutos, ok? Para depois termos tempo para o debate. Okay? Então, uh, muito obrigado, Aníbal. Muito obrigado pela presença de todas e todos. O Aníbal vai falar aqui do, do, do público. É isso? Uh, obrigado, Fabiano. Gostava de agradecer aos organizadores da Dan Fox, pelo convite, é uma grande honra a participar do Congresso da Fox. Peço imensa desculpa por falar em inglês, mas acreditem que o, o inglês com o sotaque espanhol é bem melhor do que o, o portunhol com o sotaque argentino. Então, <risos> um, so, so eu vou falar em inglês. Um, So um, this is this is a, a difficult moment for for democracies um, in Brazil and everywhere. I would say, um, as as we meet here today, of course, the Chamber of Deputies is deciding whether to authorize or rather whether to protect a President Temer again um, on on charges. And, but, the, but the concerns about democracy are, are widespread in the world. We are seeing that not only in Latin America, throughout Latin America, but also in Europe and in the US, traditional political elites are challenged. Traditional parties are delegitimized. Um, and, and we are seeing this with, with concern, right? In, if you think about it in Europe, the social democrats and the christian democrats that which anchor 
political competition in Europe for decades after World War II are now being challenged and we are seeing the emergence of a radical right becoming more and more important. There is, uh, in, in Latin America, the, the, there was a process of renewal of political elites um, 15 or 20 years ago, but even that process of political renewal is now, um, we, we get the sense that is, is, there, is a, there is a process that is, is finishing now. And so there is a great deal of uncertainty in Latin America and in the world about the, about the future of democracy because citizens are, and sometimes with good reasons, frustrated and often angry. So there is a, quite a level of uncertainty about what is going to happen. So for this reason, I think that, that taking a comparative perspective um, is, is, uh, is, is going to be very important to discuss some of those issues. And in particular, the issue that I would like to discuss today is what is the, what is the role of impeachment um, in, the, in the context of the, the democracies that emerged in Latin America after military dictatorships uh, in the 1980s. And also, what is the role of impeachment for the future of democracy in the 21st century? And the argument that I would like to, to make, I would like to make three arguments today based on, on comparative evidence and on the work that I've done in the past and, and the, the research I'm doing today. Um, the first argument is that presidential impeachment has been um, stretched, has been overtaken, has been redefined and manipulated for political reasons uh, pretty much everywhere over the last 20, 25 years. So this seems to be a common pattern throughout Latin America after the, the return of democracy. The second argument I, I'm going to make based on evidence is that Impeachments in the contemporary period after, say, 1990, impeachments quite often respond, are, are explained by some of the same causes, some of the, the same historical conditions that explain military coups in the past, in the, before the 1990s in Latin America. So there are, there are clearly historical elements that separate the two periods and that make likely that we have impeachments nowadays rather than military coups. But some of the conditions that uh, explain military coups before the 1990s are some of the conditions that are explaining impeachments nowadays. So these two elements combined, right, the idea that, that impeachments have been stretched for uh, for political purposes and the idea that some of the, the mechanisms that explain impeachments today are some of the mechanisms that explain coups in the past, uh, potentially encourage the idea and, and the interpretation that we are observing a new form of coup, right? A kind of a constitutional coup or legislative coup. However, I will, I will make a point that we should probably be careful with this argument for, for different reasons. Um, for analytical reasons, and as well as for political reasons, but also because making this argument, kind of stretching the, the idea of coups to cover these uh, strange or weird impeachments, to some extent um, may prevent us from seeing what is, I understand, the, the next big challenge for democracy in the 21st century. And this is the third argument that I'm going to make today, and the third argument is that in fact, it is hegemonic precedents, that is, precedents who are too strong rather than precedents who are too weak and, un and who are undermined by impeachments. They are the most likely challenge to democracy in the 21st century. So this is the last point I am going to make. And, and I understand that this, this claim may, may look quite strange in the context of Brazil nowadays, um, but, but hopefully I when we put the information in comparative perspective, you will get a sense of for why I will make this claim. So regarding the first, the first argument, um, impeachments were almost unknown in Latin America until the 1990s. If we look at the, the historical period, um, 
after World War II until the, the color impeachment in 1992, I can, can think of maybe one episode that could be classified as an impeachment in Latin America up to this point. Of course, during this period until the 1990s, uh, undesirable presidents, quote unquote, were removed by military interventions, not, not by, by impeachment. So, so the mili military coups were the, the typical mechanism by which presidents were removed from office. It is only the 1990s, starting with the color impeachment in 1992, that, that this became uh, a common pattern in Latin America. If you look at the period between 1992, the current impeachment and, and the Rousseff impeachment in 2016, there is hardly every year, any year in Latin America, in which there hasn't been a president who was challenged and removed from office by Congress. So throughout this period we have, depending on how we count, but we have at least eight presidents throughout the region who were removed from office by Congress, either through a conventional impeachment or through a declaration of incapacity in Congress. Um, these cases have, they, they were quite different, of course, in many ways, and we don't have time to get into the details of each one, but these cases have several elements in common, I would say. The first element that, that all of these episodes of impeachment had in common was that presidents had lost public support, or a, ma a majority of, of public support. And, and this, often it was much more than that. Quite often, in most cases, what we see is actually not only a loss of public support, but actually massive mobilizations in the streets calling for the resignation of the president. And, and this resignation, this, these mass mobilizations uh, against the presidents often uh, were triggered by, by one or two factors or both combined, which were major scandals involving corruption or abuse of power. And of course, to what extent the, the scandals are well justified or they are a media production, that's, in all the cases, it, it's a matter of dispute, in, more, in some cases more than others. So there is always some kind of, there is typically some kind of scandal about corruption or abuse of power, which of course is necessary to justify the impeachment in any case. Um, and also quite often there is some, some sort of economic crisis looming in the background, which may have to do with a decline in the rates of growth in the economy, rising unemployment, or sometimes, it, especially early during the period, it has to do with crisis of high inflation and the attempts by presidents to adopt neoliberal policies that were highly unpopular. So those elements that kind of a bad economy combined with, with accusations about corruption or abuse of power usually trigger a decline in public support and quite often mass mobilizations against the president. So this is the first element that, that these cases tend to have in common. The second element is that all of the presidents, of course, lost support in Congress. Some of them never had support in Congress, um, like, for example, um, President Bucaram in Ecuador had a very small party which was unable to stop uh, uh, the, the, his removal from office by Congress. Of course, President Collor had a very small party. So some of these presidents never had like, a very, very strong support in Congress. Other presidents had support in Congress. So, for example, uh, President uh, Carlos Andrés Pérez in Venezuela had a relatively large traditional party that supported him in Congress. Um, President Raúl Cubas in Paraguay was supported by the Colorado Party, which had a majority. But in those cases, the, the, very, the crisis itself led the parties to remove support from the president. Parties were divided into factions, and many of the factions abandoned the president. So the president lost its, its shield in Congress. It, it, it was not shielded by, by the legislature, and, and legislatures moved forward with the process of impeachment or, or a declaration of incapacity. So this is the second element that all of these presidents had in common, either small parties or 
parties that were divided along factions and so a majority of the party abandoned the president, or sometimes, as in the case of Rousseff, coalitions that broke down and therefore could not support, did not support the president. The third element that all of these cases had in common, pretty much, and this is the element I want to emphasize, is that the procedure for impeachment or declaration of incapacity was somehow stretched by legislators to do what they wanted to do, which was to get rid of the president at a certain particular moment. So this is true in virtually every case. In Venezuela, for example, in 1993, President Carlos Andrés Pérez was in, impeached on the grounds that he had misplaced um, some uh, funds that corresponded to, to the Interior Ministry, um, and, and so it wasn't clear what had happened to those funds, about $16 million. Um, so that was the justification for the impeachment. The real cause for the impeachment, of course, of course was that President Perez was, had been trying to adopt neoliberal policies that were highly unpopular, and there were massive mobilizations against him. So politicians felt that they had to get rid of the president somehow. So they tried different options. They finally found the issue of the $16 million that were unaccounted for as a, as a justification for impeachment. In the case of Paraguay in 1999, President Cuba's grave was technically impeached on, on grounds of contempt for the Supreme Court, but the real reason why he was removed from office was that because the Colorado party suspected that he had been involved in a conspiracy to kill the vice president. And President Cuba's grave, the, the, the impeachment was passed in the lower house by a difference of one vote and according to the people I interviewed, they told me that one of, one of the deputies who was willing to support the president in that vote was locked in a restroom, so they could not, they could not vote that day. Um, in, the, in the case of, of Paraguay in 2012, of course, you probably remember this. Uh, president Lugo was impeached in 40 hour, 48 hours without any real chance to defend himself. So, so this was kind of an express impeachment. And in the case of President Bucaram in, in Ecuador, that case is quite dramatic because the, there were massive demonstrations in 1997 calling for the resignation of the president. The opposition in Congress realized that they, this was a, a, a perfect opportunity to remove the president from office. But then they could not form the supermajority they needed to remove, to impeach Bucaram. And so they found a loophole in the Constitution that allowed a simple majority in Congress to declare the president me mentally incapacitated. So essentially, by a simple majority, they, they declared President Bucaram crazy um, because it was convenient, right? And Bucaram was kind of crazy, but he was not <laughs> legally crazy. So, so it's clear that, that in, in pretty much every case, the, 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 process has, the legal process has been stretched to, to allow for for an impeachment. Of course, this has been a, a serious matter of debate in the Brazilian case with the impeachment of Rousseff. Um, but if you look at, and, and, and let me say, the, the, even, even in the color case, right, which if you look at all of these cases, it's probably the most transparent process. Even in the color case, the legal, there are some legal issues that are contested. So for example, Rousseff was impeached but was not disqualified for office, and Collor, because he resigned right before, was not impeached, legally speaking, but he was disqualified for office by Congress. So there are these legal issues that loom in the background that they, they are always contested. Let me say that in comparative perspective, by Latin American standards, the two impeachment processes in Brazil have been quite well organized, right? So there are serious concerns about why Dilma Rousseff was impeached, where well, there was a legal justification for it. But the process took nine months, right? and while the process in Paraguay took 48 hours. I think that's, that's an important issue to keep in mind. So this is the, the first issue um, that I wanted to emphasize. The, there, are even, there are cases in Latin America that are even more dramatic in, term, in legal terms. Right? There, are, there are some cases in which presidents were forced to resign by popular protests, even if, they, if Congress had no opportunity to act. So popular protests just forced the resignations of presidents uh, 
like Fernando de la Rua in Argentina, for example, without any congressional impeachment. So these are involuntary resignations that, from a legal standpoint, are even more problematic. Um, something that I want to emphasize, and I will go back to this later, is that only two of these 11 cases that we are seeing on the screen, only two were presidents of the, of the new left in Latin America, so to speak. Right? So, so there is a concern that the right has been using the mechanism of impeachment as a, as a way to undermine the left. And of course, in some cases, that may be true. But, but I want to emphasize that this is a more general pattern that we have seen since the 1990s. The second point I want to, make, to emphasize is that some of the, the causes that produce these, these impeachments that I mentioned before are some of the causes that trigger military coups in the past, before the 1990s. So in a recent article we published with, with John Polga Hesimovic um, in Democratization, we analyzed 19 countries, 19 uh, periods of democracy for 19 countries in Latin America after World War II until 2010. And we analyzed the conditions that produce um, military coups and the conditions that produce a legal removal. By legal, we mean either an impeachment or one of those resignations that I just mentioned a minute ago. And, and so and we model this, we, we use a statistical model that essentially models this in two steps. The first step is whether the president is removed from office, and then the second stage in the model is how it is removed from office, whether using a coup or, a, or an impeachment, right? And of course, there are many factors that separate the past military coups from contemporary impeachments, in particular, the greater commitment to democracy among elites tends to produce impeachments rather than, than traditional military coups, and the international context, right, in the 1970s, the, the region was dominated by military dictatorships, so it was very easy for military officers to justify a coup. Today, that's, that's very difficult. But the, what I want to emphasize is the, the first stage of the model, which is the idea that, the, which, which models the, the common elements that explain both coups in the past and impeachments uh, or other forms of legal removal in the present. And we looked at, at essentially, we find that three variables are crucial. The first one is economic growth. So economic recessions destabilize presidents in general. The second one is mass demonstrations against the government. They tend to destabilize presidents in all historical periods. And the third one is the radicalization of political elites. And by that, what we mean, this concept follows from some work I've done with, with Scott Mainwaring in a, in a recent book we published in 2013. And the idea of radicalization of political elites implies that political elites embrace policy positions about which they are intransigent. They are unwilling to negotiate. And of course, um, I can talk about how we measure that later, but of course what that produces is unwillingness to compromise, which is very problematic in, in a democratic context. So we model, we, we use this statistical model, and I will not uh, enter into the details, the statistical details, but we can talk about those if you want later. Um, we model, we, we have a statistical model that models the risk of a legal removal and a, list, and a risk of a military coup um, using those variables and many other controls as, as predictors. And what we find, this is the, the, the plot for the risk of legal removals, and this is the plot for the risk of military coups in this after World War II. And this is per capita growth. What, we are, what I am showing here is the, the predicted probability, the expected probability of a coup or a legal removal based on those predicted predictors. This is the, the level of per capita growth in the country. So high levels of growth, periods of great prosperity, negative growth, periods of economic recessions. Notice that economic recessions increase the risk of legal removals in the present but also produce a high risk of military coups in the past. So when the economy is bad, people are willing to get rid of the president in any historical period. Similarly, it happens with, with mass demonstrations, right? When the economy is bad, people are often more willing to take the streets and more sensitive to corruption issues, they're more willing to take the streets against the government. And, and here you can see this is the number of major demonstrations in any given year, major demonstrations against the government. And you can see that when the population mobilizes re recurrently against the government, the risk of legal removals goes up, but also the risk of military coups goes up. 
So mobilization against the government destabilizes all presidents in all periods. And ra the radicalization of political elites, this variable here is essentially the, the proportion of major political actors in the system that we consider radicalized in our work with Scott Mainwaring in, in, in any given year. And as you can see, when political elites radicalize, then um, the risk of legal removals goes up and the risk of military coups goes up. So essentially, we, uh, I have made the point that first, the, the institution of impeachment has, has been stretched by politicians to get rid of presidents, um, even in situations in which the, the law is, is, is not completely supportive of what they want to do. And I have shown that that some of the conditions that produce military coups in the past are producing impeachments at the present. So a, a natural question now is, is to think, well, so are we observing some form of neo-coups, a new version of, of coups in the 21st century? Um, and of course, many people have made this claim that impeachments are kind of a new version of military coups. Now, I would say that rather than, I, let me say that I think this idea is a, is a bit problematic. Rather than, than saying that political elites are using impeachments as a new form of coups, I think it's probably more appropriate to say that political elites are using impeachments, presidential impeachment, and distorting the institution of impeachment as an equivalent of a vote of no confidence in a parliamentary system. I think that's probably a more accurate representation of what is going on today. The idea that we are observing a new form of coup, I think is, is, is true in some way, but it's problematic in a, in, in a different way. It's true in the sense that clearly, as, I, as I've showed you, um, political elites have found, in the current context in which military coups are very hard to implement, political elites have found constitutional or quasi-constitutional ways to get to remove presidents who are unpopular. That's, that's absolutely true. But if we embrace the idea of the neo-coup, I think we, we confront two very important political problems. There, are, there is, of course, an, some analytical, analytical problems. But there are, I think, two fundamental political problems. The first political problem, I think, which, which makes me very uncomfortable, is that, as I showed you, many presidents have been removed through impeachments and dubious impeachments sometimes in the past or simply by popular demonstrations. Most of those presidents were not presidents on the left, were actually presidents on the right. Most of the, those presidents belonged to the neoliberal period. And so if we embrace the idea of the neo-coup, we are forced to claim that the social movements that mobilize against those neoliberal policies and force the impeachment or the resignation of those presidents were somehow involved in this new form of coups which either forces us to accept that those social movements were supporters of coups of some kind, or that there are kind of good coups and bad coups. And the two ideas make me quite uncomfortable because I think they distort the historical record in, in a way. So, so my, my, my feeling again is that political elites are stretching the, the use of impeachment probably to try to craft the equivalent of a functional equivalent to the vote of no confidence, in that way distorting the institution of presidential impeachment. But the, probably the idea of coup is, is problematic for, for that reason I, I just mentioned. But also embracing the idea of a, of a neo coup, I think, is problematic for a different reason, which is that, in my view, it potentially prevents us from identifying with, which is what is, uh, for me, the major threat, or is going to be the major threat for democracy, in the Latin American democracy and democracy everywhere in the 21st century. And that is not weak presence undermined by impeachment, it's on the contrary, very strong presence who concentrate power. <coughs> so let me make this claim. Is, is impeachment the, the, the big threat for democracy in the 21st century? I think not. I, I think what we are seeing in, in Latin America, in some cases like Venezuela, but also throughout the world, in cases like Hungary or Poland nowadays, is that the main threat to democracy comes in the form of backsliding. That is a, a progressive 
mechanism by which governments undermine the democratic process and take over other institutions progressively. Um, for example, Milan Svolik has pointed out that in the past democracies were, were dismantled through military coups, but nowadays they're usually dismantled by, by, by what he calls executive takeovers. That is the, the idea that executives take over the whole system. And, and Nancy Bermeo, on, on a recent article on, on democratic backsliding, has also pointed out that backsliding also often involves what she calls executive aggrandizement. That is the expansion of the executive and the control over other institutions. So these, these works are concerned, again, are, they are focusing not just on Latin America, but also there is a very clear wave of concern about what's going on in Europe, in advanced democracies like, like Hungary or Poland nowadays, in which those processes are clearly in, oper in operation. So, to what extent is this a problem or has been a problem in Latin America? Uh, we are, I am working with a, with a team at uh, Universidad de la República in Uruguay, with Daniela Byron and Nicolás Schmidt, um, to develop an index of what we call executive hegemony or presidential hegemony. And the idea is that this index essentially captures, if, if you look at, at Latin American countries, we look at 18 Latin American countries going back to 1925, we measure to what extent the president in different historical moments in democratic periods, not in authoritarian periods, to what extent presidents have gained control over the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Tribunal and Congress, right? Essentially partisan control. So, it's, so, so we want to capture to what extent presidents have control over other institutions of government in a separation of power system. Um, and I will tell you in a minute how we measure that. But, and then we use this variable, this index of, of presidential hegemony, to predict the breakdown of democratic regimes in Latin America um, since 1925. So, so this, this information comes again from my book with Mainwaring, and we, so for every year of democracy in Latin America, we have a variable that captures if democracy breaks down and the, and the regime becomes authoritarian because of a military coup or some other reason. Um, and so the way in which we measure presidential hegemony is that we use, we have four indicators, right? Two are kind of indicators of strong control of the president over other institutions, two are, two are weaker indicators of control over other institutions, and these, these indicators uh, relate to, the, to Congress and to the judiciary. So for Congress, we look at, for every year of democracy in Latin America since 1925, we look at the percentage of seats that are controlled by the president's party or, or the faction that responds to the president um, if the party is factionalized in, in every country, in every year. And as a weaker indicator of support for the president, we look at coalitions. To what extent there is a, what's the size of the coalition that supports the president in Congress? And then for the judiciary, we look at the percentage of justices sitting in the Supreme Court in any given year who have been nominated by the president, or, and then for a weaker indicator, we look at the percentage of justices who have been nominated by the president's party. That is, maybe during previous administrations that, in which the president was a different person but belonged to the same party. And, and so we have this information, information for the four indicators for all the countries in Latin America, and we combine this information in two ways. First, we, we take an unweighted index, which is the, essentially the mean of these four percentages. So it essentially ranges from zero to 100, 100 means that the president has complete partisan control over other institutions. Zero means that the president has no control whatsoever. And then we, we create an alternative index, which is a weighted mean using factor analysis. So it essentially varies between minus two and plus two. Plus two means, again, means that the president has complete control over, over other institutions. But as you will see, the, the two indices produce the same results. So we use so, so, here what you, what you can see is the, the, the value of this index, the unweighted index, which is the dark bars, um, for the different countries in our sample, the, the measure of presidential hegemony in different periods, and these red marks are episodes of, of democratic breakdown, either through military coup or because the incumbent took over the system. So, what you can see is that there are some cases in which, in, 
in many cases, right, the, when the, the index of residential hegemony goes above, above 0.5, which means that the president has strong co control over other institutions, we see pretty quickly a democratic breakdown. This is the case of Argentina around 1951, when, when Perón essentially took over the system. Right? This is Argentina in the 1930s. Notice that when we see periods of long stretch, stretches of democracy, like Costa Rica after the Civil War, levels of presidential hegemony tend to be relatively low, meaning that there is an important level of plurality in the system. And so we use this, this is preliminary evidence in favor of the idea that strong concentration of power by the executive triggers the breakdown of democracy, either because the president is able to take over the system, which is one possibility as in the case of Perón, but also, and this is, I think has been more often the case in Latin America, because the opposition fears that the president will take over and will impose uh, very costly policies, and so the opposition conspires against the president to, un to undermine the president. So this is the story in Venezuela in 2002, but it's also the story in Turkey in 2016, for example. Um, so we use this variable, again I will not get into the details of the statistical model because we don't have time, but we use this variable that measures presidential control of, of other branches to measure, to, to model the probability that democracy will break down in Latin America. And so this is a model without any controls in which this is the only variable that predicts democratic breakdown. This is a, vari this is a model with controls, institutional controls like uh, the number of parties in the legislature and also socioeconomic controls, the level of economic development and so on. But essentially in the two models we see the same story. As the level of presidential control of, over other institutions increases, the risk of democratic breakdown goes up. Right? The bands here are the confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. There are very few democratic presidents with very high levels of control of other institutions, and that's why the confidence interval widens here. But notice that this is, we see the same pattern with in models with controls and without controls. When we use the unweighted index, and when we use the weighted index, when we use the weighted index, we see exactly the same pattern. So greater control of the executive of, over other institutions tends to destabilize democracies, as I said before, either because the eventually the, the executive is successful and takes over the system, or because the opposition launches a preemptive coup because they are afraid that that is going to happen. So, the main threat to democracy in Europe nowadays, and in Latin America, if you look at cases of like Venezuela, for example, seems to be not so much the problem of weak presidents undermined by impeachments, but the problem of extremely strong presidents who are potentially able to take over the system, controlling other institutions, and sometimes triggering undemocratic reactions from the opposition. I understand that, speaking to a Brazilian audience, this may look like a problem from Mars, right? This is, this is a very distant threat. Um, but that's precisely why I think comparison is very important. Because I think there are two, two important messages here that come from this, from this analysis. The first one is that sometimes this functional institution, in a, in a historical context in which presidential hegemony constitutes the main threat for democratic stability, these functional institutions may actually be a blessing. Right? This is what we are seeing nowadays in the United States, for example. President Trump would be a much more serious threat for American democracy if it wasn't the case that the president's party is completely paralyzed. Right? The, even though the president formally has a majority in Congress, the president's party has been completely unable to support his policies. And in the US case, this kind of paralysis may actually be a good thing. So, so in the, the first conclusion, I think, is that sometimes we need, we need to learn to value dysfunctional institutions in a context in which presidents' ex executive control may be a, a serious problem for democracy. Most importantly, I think that we need to pay attention 
to this problem. Even if it looks like a very distant threat, this is a call for to be aware. Because in context in which presidential power disseminates, is, is dissolved by dysfunctional institutions, in context in which the institution of impeachment is abused by elites, party elites, who are delegitimized. And in context in which um, people are very angry at the government, frustrated with the, those dysfunctional institutions, there is always a natural call among the population for a reconstitution of presidential power with the expectation that strong presidents will be able to save the country from the corrupt politicians. And of course, as I've shown you, that, that attempt to reconstitute political power may and quite often ends up in a poor situation, in a, in a bad situation for democracy. So I think we, we all need to be aware of this potential problem um, throughout Latin America and in many other countries. Because in the short run, the misuse of impeachment may create weak precedents um, and, and deadlock. But over the long run, it may call for a reconstitution of presidential power, and Ecuador is a classic example in this regard, that ultimately could be a serious threat for the democratic process. Thank you very much for your attention. Ok, então temos, muito obrigado Aníbal pela excelente palestra e acho que tem muitos elementos para debate, sobretudo levando-se em consideração a experiência brasileira recente e tendo em vista isso, o tempo que temos, é? bastante ah, propício, né? E abro aí a palavra para, para os colegas, para os colegas tecerem os comentários e levantarem as questões. Posso falar em português? Realmente muito interessante a sua pesquisa. Estou de acordo com a relação entre impeachments e golpes. Agora, eu fiquei em séria dúvida sobre a sua conclusão. Sobre a conclusão de que é muito interessante, né? e baseada numa pesquisa, de que quanto mais forte né, for o presidente ou a figura do presidente, mais, mais, mais provável é um golpe. Não porque, porque a, a ideia seja contraditória. Não, as contradições são muitas vezes muito úteis. Né? Uh, mas é porque, na pesquisa, vocês misturam dois tipos de países. Vocês misturam o Paraguai com o Brasil. Não sei se país grande já, que, já, que já realizou a produção capitalista, além do Brasil, estão os, os países que vocês examinaram. Mas imagino que esteja Argentina lá, que esteja México lá. Né? Quer dizer, e, a, e Argentina bom, e, e Brasil... E o Brasil, se você estivesse pensando no Brasil de 1964 ou de 1955, aí tudo bem. Mas quando você começa a falar de acontecimentos no Brasil de 1992 ou de agora 2016, que são países, é um país que já realizou sua revolução capitalista, já fez uma transição que eu considero consolidada para a democracia, e, portanto, é muito diferente da situação do Paraguai, do Equador ou da Venezuela. É isso. Aníbal, a pergunta é muito mais simples. Né? Bom, 
Eu só queria entender por que você deixou o caso de Honduras de fora, né? que me parece um caso importante, e eu vi que você não, não elencou ali, queria só entender o motivo disso. Oi, bom dia. É, eu gostaria de saber se você considera que é, o século XXI agora está inaugurando um tempo de impeachments como o melés da, do presidencialismo enquanto um regime político. É, ou seja, mesmo no caso dos Estados Unidos, quando o Trump foi eleito, rondou o espectro do impeachment também. Então, eu queria saber se você acha que o presidencialismo em si é mais afeito a impeachments, né? o golpes, ou enfim, o que quer que seja, abuso do poder, do que outras formas de governo. Qual seria a sua opinião? Obrigada. Thank you for, for the questions. Um, Regarding the first question, no, I, I completely agree that the, the situation in, in Brazil today, of course, is very different than the situation in 1954 or 55. Uh, and, and overall, the situation in Latin America overall is, is quite different from the situation in the 1950s, right? even in countries like Paraguay. Um, so, so I think this, that's, that's a very important point. Um, and I think it's, it's absolutely correct. What, what, What I would like to emphasize, though, is two points. The first one is that what is somewhat perplexing about the contemporary period, and this is what is leading me to study this problem of presidential hegemony, is that we are seeing the erosion of democracy in countries in which democracy was very well established and countries that are quite prosperous. So the situation in Hungary nowadays, or in Poland, as I mentioned before, situations in which governments are clearly taking over all institutions, undermining political rights for the opposition. Um, it's very concerning because it may be signaling that there is something about the early 21st century that is marking a break with the past. And so, and thus, um, I think I, I, I agree that the situation in Brazil is not concerning today, but I, that's why I say that generally we need to be aware about the future, because clearly we are seeing problems in countries in which we never expected to see problems. Um, and more generally, I, I would say that the, and, and I think this is crucial to emphasize, my point is not that presidents have to be weak. I think that's also a common mistake that people make. My point is that We need all institutions to be strong. So a strong president needs to be matched by a strong judiciary and a strong Congress. Right? It's that kind of equilibrium that really produces a vibrant democracy. Um, Claudio, the issue, the issue of Honduras. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I did not mention Honduras in, in, my, in my initial chart um, because I was, for reasons of time, I was just discussing this legal removals from office, either impeachments or declarations of incapacity or forced resignations. Honduras, in my view, is one of the few cases in the contemporary period after 1990 in which we essentially see a, a more traditional military intervention. So, and there are only three of those, really. It's Honduras in 2009, in which the military essentially, with support of Congress and the judiciary, but the, essentially the military went overnight and took the president from the presidential palace. Um, the case of Hamil Mawad in Ecuador in 2000, which, in which it was a, a completely opposite ideological sign, but it was the military essentially removing, taking over Congress and removing the president from office. And then the, the case of, of Francisco Ser, of, uh, Serrano in, in Guatemala in 1993, which is a strange case because Serrano tried to organize an autogolpe against Congress, and then the middle ranks turned against him, so he was, he was removed from office by the middle ranks. So these are three cases in which the military clearly had 
a dominant role in the process. And, and so Honduras, I think it's, it's comparable to, to, particularly to Paraguay, in the, in the kind of the nature of the situation, the coalition that overthrew the president, but the dynamic was institutionally completely different because the military were the key actor by contrast to Paraguay. Um, and then regarding the, the, the question about the 21st century, Yes, I think so. I think that in a context in which military coups are unlikely, as I suggested, which is the context of Latin America after 1990, impeachments have been an important mechanism to remove presidents. So impeachments have become, again, kind of a, a distorted functional equivalent of a vote of no confidence by elites. So this, this has always been present in the contemporary period in, in Latin America, as I showed. I think what is going on nowadays, however, and this is probably, as you pointed out, accelerating this risk or increasing this risk, is that we are observing societies, not only in Latin America, but also in the US and in other places, we are seeing societies that are highly polarized and more polarized than they were in the past. So if you think about the color impeachment, for example, right, it seems that everyone was against color at the moment of impeachment. There were small groups that supported the president, but for the most part, the society came together against the president and in favor of impeachment. If you think about the, the, the Rousseff impeachment, the story is quite different, right? For, for us, for, for me coming from Argentina, it was surprising to see that Brazilian society could become so polarized because we always assumed that polarization was kind of an Argentine vice and problem, but that Brazilians were different. So the level of polarization we observed in Brazilian society is quite astonishing. And the level of polarization that we observe in the US nowadays is quite astonishing. So there are multiple factors, I think, including the, the development of, of uh, social networks and other mechanisms that encourage polarization um, more, more today than in the past. Um, and, and that probably is, is, means that, as you, as you suggested, we are more likely to see um, calls for impeachment in presidential regimes in the future. Um, I hope, however, that politically we learn to use impeachments in a more prudent way, in, in, a, in a way that aligns more with the Constitution. Either that or everyone accepts that impeachment is equivalent of a vote of no confidence and then it's used freely. But kind of the intermediate situation that we have nowadays is, is very problematic and, and delegitimizing for the process. Temos a chance de mais uma rodada, Rogério, Maria Rita e Bruno. Aníbal, aqui. Obrigado pela sua, pela sua exposição. É, eu não tenho uma pergunta sobre o impeachment, eu tenho uma pergunta que queria te ouvir um pouco sobre a ciência política. Por que, que nós erramos tanto? É, durante um bom tempo nós é, acreditávamos que a instabilidade do presidencialismo latino-americano se devia à fraqueza dos presidentes. Depois, com o deslocamento do presidencialismo, o distanciamento do modelo presidencialista latino-americano em relação ao americano, no sentido da aquisição de maiores poderes de agenda e poderes legislativos, nós achávamos que então o problema tinha sido corrigido. Até por volta de 2014, no Brasil, a gente achava que estávamos condenados à monótona estabilidade democrática e presidencialista. É, e agora você nos traz o argumento de que, porque os presidentes são fortes, aumenta a probabilidade de crise. Eu sei que você trabalha com o índice de força do presidente, que vai além do poder de agenda, e vai além dos poderes legislativos, passa pelo controle do legislativo como um todo e até do poder judiciário. Eu, mais tarde, me ocuparei de entender melhor essa forma com a qual você trabalha. Mas a pergunta não é exatamente sobre os seus critérios de força ou fraqueza do presidencialismo, mas por que, que a ciência política erra tanto nos seus diagnósticos e nas suas previsões com relação a ao presidencialismo latino-americano. Obrigado. A minha observação é mais é, relativa 
a, ao fundamento das suas conclusões. É, quando é, eu observo rapidamente por essa exposição que a sua fundamentação se baseia nessa, é, nesse exercício, nesse modelo é, econométrico ou, enfim, estatístico, que vai de 1925 a 2016, é, eu fico, uh, no mínimo, uh, descontente por imaginar que, nesse período de uh, quase 100 anos, profundas transformações ocorreram nesses países. Quando o professor Bresser levanta, olha, o golpe de 2016 e o de 54 e 64 no Brasil tem diferenças, eu imagino que em todos eles tem muitas diferenças. E tentar explicar essas profundas diferenças com um modelo só, eu tenho sérias dúvidas. Eu confesso que eu fico bastante é, é, desconfiada sobre a base fundamental dessas conclusões. Só para dizer alguma coisa muito geral, é, a partir de... Quer dizer, primeiro eu não sei por que 25, certamente porque é aí que tem dados. Então, já isso me parece algo muito complicado. Segundo, nós sabemos que a partir dos anos 30 da, da crise, é, todos os estados e todos os executivos se tornaram mais fortes no mundo. Exatamente, é, a aplicação das, das políticas keynesianas é, levaram os executivos de todo o mundo a ficarem mais fortes frente aos demais poderes. Então, eu gostaria de ver como vocês enfrentam estes problemas metodológicos que são fundamentais para as conclusões. Aníbal, obrigado. Ah, duas coisinhas. A primeira que me ocorre foi que, tentando olhar o quadro com todos os países, é, com, tem os golpes e o nível de peso presidencial em cada um deles ok, na maioria dos casos aparece quando a coluna sobe vem o golpe o Brasil, o único caso de golpe que acontece se dá ao contrário o sinal invertido, João Goulart está com influência peculiarmente baixa sobre o sistema quando acontece a setinha vermelha então a, a quando o Bresser levantou o problema sobre tipos de países, eu fiquei me perguntando sobre eventuais controles. Né? Sobre, sei lá, pode ser perfil produtivo, pode ser dados político-institucionais, sistema partidário, etc. Fragmentação, polarização, etc. Sistema partidário de tipo sartoriano, qualquer coisa. Então, a primeira pergunta é essa. Sobre cogitação de eventuais controles dentro... Da, da amostra em que diferentes países eventualmente poderiam se comportar de maneira distinta e a segunda coisa que é relacionada também com, com esse, esse mesmo exercício que é o crucial uh, é o seguinte independente do juízo que a gente tem a respeito dos processos de impeachment se eles são né, o golpe ou não né, ok, eu acho que a gente é sempre compelido a algum juízo como cidadãos e até como analistas, mas, de fato, uma coisa é parar um tanque na porta do palácio e eventualmente matar o presidente, outra coisa é o parlamento se mexer, ainda que stretching a legalidade. Ah, mas como a gente funciona operacionalmente, o modo pelo qual elites políticas eventualmente intervêm sobre o processo, a partir dos anos 90, vem a ser predominantemente o impeachment, se não caberia replicar o exercício tomando golpes e ou processos de impeachment para ver eventualmente se os, as razões que produzem, quer dizer, se eventualmente no contexto dos impeachments o peso presidencial permanece importante ou não. Porque se ele é o substituto funcional, então ele vai ser o efeito que vai ser produzido pela mesma crise. Então caberia eventualmente, independente do juízo sobre sobre a legitimidade dos impeachments, fazer o exercício incluindo golpes e impeachments. Exatamente para deixar matérias de juízo normativo separadas desse diagnóstico.
very interesting questions. Thank you. Um, why why political science uh, fails? Um, let me put this in perspective. I think that I think it's it's not necessarily that political science fails so much. I, I would be more generous with our colleagues and with our discipline. I think you're right, but part of the problem we have is that, which is, which is true for any science, but is particularly problematic for the social sciences, is that we can only interpret the future based on the past, based on what we know about the past. And so, in some ways, we are, we are similar to the armies, right? The armies are always ready to fight the last war they fought, and, but they don't, they don't know how the next war is going to be. And in, in some ways, we are, we are a little bit like that. We are, we are always prepared to interpret the, the process we are observing based on the information we have about the past. But the world around us changes. And, and of course, this is, this is a bit frustrating because quite often, by the time we have a great book about a, an important problem, that book is not a matter of concern for public opinion and people are concerned about something else. Right? Um, so it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult to defend the, the careful work of our discipline, the, the collection of data, the analysis of historical information, and so on and so forth, vis-a-vis -vis people who just give opinions right, uh, more freely uh, at, at the right moment because, because they, they, they are free to do so. Um, so in, in moments of great change, of great uncertainty, quite often we make mistakes. But at the same time, in, in moments in which the, the system stabilizes, I think that the discipline has been quite successful in producing interpretations, sometimes conflicting interpretations about how the system works. And in that sense, we, we, we have an important role in helping define institutions and, and institutional design. So, I think you are right, but, but we, 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 don't need, we, we don't have to be excessively pessimistic about the discipline. The, our discipline face confronts, confronts very important challenges, and, and which are very difficult for us, but we need, that's why I think we need to be aware in terms of what could be the problems of the future, and try to understand those problems of the future to the extent that we can, based on, on co comparative information about other countries and about the past. Um, and, and this leads, I think, very nicely into the second question, which, which is, is, I think, it's a very, very legitimate and, and very important question. Um, so, on one hand, it's true that executives became much more important during the period we are analyzing, and much more, much more stronger, um, because they developed these administrative capacities that they didn't have in, during the liberal period. That, that's absolutely true. Now, the, I, I think that's not so much the source of instability we are detecting. The source of instability we are detecting is the capacity of executives, irrespective of their administrative capacities, to gain control over other institutions that represent pluralism and diversity and checks and balances in the system. So when what we are observing, and that's essentially what our measure captures, when executives gain control over Congress through partisan mechanisms, it's not, I, I cannot get into the details, but it's not so much coalitions as you can imagine, it's mostly partisan, hard partisan control of Congress. And when executives gain hard partisan control over the Supreme Court, that signals that they have no horizontal accountability, they have no checks. And therefore, that's the moment at which either they go ahead and they gain control over everything, or the opposition conspires to overthrow them, historically. Um, so I think it's, your point about the administrative capacities is central, but, but that, I think that's not, we should not worry about that. We should worry about institution, control of other, other political institutions, not administrative institutions. Re, the, other, the other point that is, that is uh, related to, to Professor Bresser's point, which is central is, is the idea that over time we have seen changes in the, in the way in which the world operates, right? So one possibility here, one possibility is that 
historically more concentration of power in the executive consistently produces uh, instability, irrespective of the period. And that, that, is, that is in some way the argument I made. Another possibility would be that if we, if we cut the analysis in different historical periods, the effects of concentration of power in the executive in different historical periods would be different. In some contexts, for example, in, at the present, it may produce, it may be less likely to produce democratic instability. And, and I think you are right about that, because, because military coups, for example, are less likely nowadays, it is less likely that concentration of power in the executive will trigger a full-fledged military coup as in the past, although we have seen some in, in Honduras, for example. So in, in that, on that point, I think you're absolutely right. However, I think we still have enough signals in the contemporary period that high concentration of power in the executive tends to trigger this kind of problematic dynamic. We have seen this signal, this, this process in Venezuela, developing over time. And of course, we have seen this process in Turkey, developing over time. We have seen this process in, in Hungary, developing. So, Clearly, even in parliamentary systems, concentration of power in the executive tends to trigger this problematic dynamic in the contemporary period, right? even if the overall effects may have changed over time. Uh, but I think that's, that's a crucial point. Um, in relation to controls, let me see if I can go back to them all. So we have, we have in, the, in the model with controls, we have some institutional controls about um, the number of the, the formal presidential powers, that, that is, to what extent the, the president has agenda setting power in the constitution and so on. We have controls about the number of parties in the system. We have several institutional controls that in some ways seek to account for, for transform, some of the institutional transformations over time. Um, in, in some, of course, in some countries, the party system is highly fragmented, so that could be part of the explanation for instability, um, based on the more traditional Lindsay and understanding of, of presidential instability. Over time, presidential powers in most constitutions have been going up, because presidential constitutions have provided more powers for the president. So we include several institutional controls in the model to account for this, but even, even so, the, the the concentration of partisan power in the executive seems to be a source of instability. Related to the point of impeachment, I think your, your point is crucial because what is going on in the present is that if executives gain a lot of control, and again, Venezuela, I think, is a classic example of this. If presidents gain a lot of control over other institutions, then the the possibility of impeachment gets closed because they, they, they close that, that road for the opposition. And so, because the possibility of impeachment is closed, two things may happen, right? One, which is Venezuela in 2002, is that the opposition may conspire to overthrow the president using the military. Um, or for different reasons, is, this is the case in, in Honduras in 2009. The other possibility is that the president and constrained by Congress and the judiciary, it may move forward and eventually dismantle democracy piece by piece. So, so I think that's the kind of risk that we, we can foresee in the future. Bom, pergunto se eu acho que cabe, se alguém quiser, uh, mais uma perguntinha, Luiz, para encerrar. Ali. Uma pergunta vai mais no sentido de chamar a atenção para um, para um aspecto é, que eu considero importante. Seria a capacidade do presidente controlar o Congresso, né, ou barganhar com ele. É, eu digo isso porque, no caso brasileiro, você chamou a atenção corretamente para que, de que o, o, o impeachment do Collor foi diferente do impeachment da Dilma. Mas teve um aspecto, um aspecto que foi bem parecido que foi a incapacidade dos presidentes controlarem o Congresso. E a gente tem, atualmente, um presidente absolutamente impopular, né? mas que parece conseguir barganhar melhor e ele não cai. Eu queria saber como é que fica isso 
dentro do teu trabalho. Tá? Obrigado. I think that's that's an, an excellent point. If if the if the, the processes against Colren and and Rousseff have an element in common, is that in both cases, Prussians were unwilling or unable to create effective bargains with Congress. And I think this this is common to to both both processes. Uh, so so the, and, and therefore the coalitions collapsed. So so I think this this point is central. Um, and the current president clearly has has control over Congress only in a in a minimalist way. Let's say, right? The, the current president is able to stop things in, to stop a catastrophe in Congress by buying out support. In that sense, um, the current situation in Brazil resembles a little bit the situation in Colombia in the 1990s when President Samper was accused of receiving money from, the, from, from drug dealers for his campaign. Essentially, his whole operation during, the, during his term in office was to a great extent intended to survive in office. So he, was, he survived without, without governing much by, by buying support in, in Congress over time. So yes, I think we, are, we, we see some situations in which presidents who are willing to bargain with Congress are able to prevent an impeachment, even which is a different type of problem, right? This impeachment sometimes should happen, but it doesn't happen because presidents are willing to negotiate with Congress. This is a different, a very different type of, of control of Congress, of, of the full control that I was mentioning before, right? The kind of direct partisan control. This is a, a situation in which a coalition is willing to support the president if and only the president is able to provide benefits. When that, if that doesn't happen, then the coalition is potentially disbanded. Bom, chegamos então ao término da sessão. Queria agradecer a presença de todos, agradecer especialmente o amigo por ter vindo se deslocado aqui até até Caxambu, ter feito essa excelente excelente palestra e ter nos proporcionado esse excelente debate. Não é? É, muito obrigado, amigo. Obrigado a todos e até a próxima.